In the previous video, we saw that neutral alleles and advantageous alleles fixed with different probabilities and took different amounts of time, and that's because there are in fact two forces that are changing allele frequencies over time. There are changes due to random factors, so that's genetic drift, and there are changes due to selection, which we looked at for the advantageous alleles. What we'll think about now is what is kind of the balance between these, or in particular, under what conditions is selection going to be more powerful than drift when we're thinking about a population. First of all, the change in the allele frequency due to random changes or genetic drift, that change is PQ over 2N, and so that change in frequency per generation is less for larger populations, right, because that would have a larger denominator. This equation is very similar to one that you may have seen in biostats when you were thinking about the variation in uh, the binomial distribution. The second thing that changes allele frequencies are changes due to selection. So if we have these fitnesses here, the change in allele frequency is PQ divided by the mean fitness, multiplied by P, W11 minus W12, plus Q, W12 minus W22. That's our equation from earlier in the semester. We can take these fitnesses, plug them in. 11 minus 12 is just this minus this, so all you would get is S. 1, 2 minus 2, 2 is this minus this, so all you would get is S. The S is grouped together, you would get P plus Q. P plus Q is 1. This S can come out to the front, so the change in frequency is just S, P, Q divided by the mean fitness. Assuming that we're working with small values of S, then the mean fitness is about 1. That denominator is about 1, which means the change in allele frequency is really about just S times P times Q. So the change in the allele frequency due to random drift per generation is PQ divided by 2N. Change in the allele frequency due to selection per generation is SPQ. So when is the change due to selection larger than the change due to drift? That would be when SPQ is larger than PQ divided by 2N. The P and Q cancel, so you get S larger than 1 over 2N. So when is selection more effective than drift or more powerful than drift? when S is larger than 1 over 2N, and that tells us that selection actually works better in larger populations, because for a given value of S, it will be larger than 1 over 2N more often when that population size is very large. So this result shows us that selection is generally much more effective in larger populations, and drift will be more important in smaller populations. Another way we can think about this same thing is when we thought about the two forces that influence the fixation probability. So we thought about fixation probability and we looked at neutral and selected alleles. Again, thinking about these fitnesses, if S is zero, that capital A allele is neutral, so it would only fix by genetic drift. So the probability of fixing a single copy is one over two N. So of course that's less for larger populations. If S is not equal to zero, so in other words, these fitnesses are different, then the capital A allele is either advantageous or deleterious, and so selection would be occurring. The probability of fixing is given by this equation, and that reduces to probability equals 2s when it's advantageous. The equation doesn't really reduce very well when it's deleterious. So when the capital A allele is advantageous, the fixation probability is about 2 times s. Remember s being the advantage seen in the heterozygote. When is the probability of something fixing due to selection larger than its probability fixing just due to drift? That would be when this is larger than this, 2s larger than 1 over 2n. We can divide both sides by 2. That would be when s is larger than 1 over 4n. So we can see the same result that we saw in the previous slide, that selection is going to be more effective at causing the fixation of advantageous alleles that have a given advantage in a larger population, right? Because as n gets larger, the threshold for s to be larger than 1 over 4n um, gets lower and lower, so more and more minor advantages will have a higher chance of fixing the neutral alleles. So this is just another way of seeing that selection works better in larger populations. So in the previous slide, selection changes the frequency faster than drift. In this slide, selection causes the allele to fix more than drift, both in larger populations. So at the top here, we have our results from before, that the probability of fixing a new allele, if it's neutral, is 1 over 2n. Probability of fixing a new advantageous allele, 
if it's at 1 over 2n frequency, is 2 times s. So now let's think about, in a population, if you're looking at a certain locus, how often is that population going from one allele to the next allele to the next allele over time? So what is the rate of substitution, the change in the wild type allele for a population? So the rate of substitution, assuming a mutation rate of mu, so that's the per locus mutation rate to a new allele. If we're looking at the neutral case, there's 2n mu mutations per generation, right? The number of loci times the mutation rate, each of which has a probability of fixing of 1 over 2n. So this many new alleles per generation, this probability of each of them fixing, the 2n's actually cancel and you have mu. So the rate at which a population acquires new alleles at a locus is just equal to the mutation rate per individual at that locus. On the other hand, mutations that are creating new advantageous alleles, 2n mu is the number of mutations per generation that arise, each of which has a probability fixing of 2s. So now when you multiply, things don't cancel, you get 4n mu s, and this actually tells you that the rate of substitution, so that is changes from one wild type allele to the next wild type allele, the rate of new alleles evolving when they're advantageous is 4 times n times mu times s. So that rate goes up when the population is bigger. It also goes up when the selective advantage of these new alleles is bigger. But these will be generally rare, right? Mutations that improve fitness are probably much more rare than neutral mutations. So assuming the advantageous mutations are rare, the overall rate of substitution should actually be determined by the rate of neutral evolution, right? This is happening most of the time. And what this guy noticed, this is Motu Kimura, who's the first one who really thought about this, that most substitutions um, would be neutral. And so because of this, the rate of substitution would just be equal to the mutation rate. And that would mean that the rate of molecular evolution, right, new alleles in the population, that rate actually wouldn't have anything to do with the size of the population. It would just be some sort of probably constant rate based on DNA mutation rates. So is that actually true? Here's some data comparing nucleotide substitutions, so that's differences in nucleotides at a certain protein, and then comparing how long ago those species diverged from each other. And so if we think about species that diverged from each other recently, like human and chimp, there are not very many substitutions. On the other hand, if we look at species that diverged from each other longer ago, like cow and pig, they diverged about 50 million years ago, there are more substitutions, more genetic differences in the wild type alleles. And if we go even back further, right, so cow versus humans, we diverged about 80 to 90 million years ago, even more differences between our sequences for this gene. And then human and kangaroo, right, placental mammal and marsupial, way back then, even more changes. And so these number of changes, they actually kind of line up on a straight line pretty well. Here's another um, set of data. This is looking at alpha globin at even more distantly related things. If we compare to humans, cows, platypus, chicken, bony fish, and cartilaginous fish, again, you see there's a fairly constant rate over time between the number of substitutions and the amount of time. This evidence kind of supports Motu Kimura's proposal for a rate of molecular evolution that is fairly constant and doesn't really have much to do with the population size. And if the rate of substitution were constant, and if we could date some of these splits with fossils, for example, we would have some sort of fossil evidence for the, when the split between cows and humans occurred, or when the split between placental and marsupials occurred. If we could put numbers on some of these divergences here, we could actually create something called a molecular clock. A molecular clock works in the following way. So say we have a phylogeny for three different taxa, and we have the number of substitutions that we know have happened on each of these branches within our phylogeny. If the rates are constant, and we have dates for at least one split, we can do the following. We build a tree, right? so A and B are sister taxa, and then C is basal to them. Compute the number of changes on each branch, which we can do just by looking at the nucleotide sequences and comparing them. And if we can date one of these splits using fossils or geology, so for example, if we knew the split between this clade and this clade occurred 80 million years ago, then we could figure out this 
because 80 million years ago, this split occurred, and since then we've had eight substitutions. So that's like one every 10 million years. And in this lineage, if we've got three substitutions here that are synapomorphies for A and B, and then five after they split, then we can infer that this split here is 50 million years ago. So if we have a phylogeny, and we have substitutions, and we can assume constant rate of change, then all we have to do is date one split, and we can put numbers on these other splits. We don't have fossil evidence showing this, but we can infer the timing of that split by using a molecular clock. So that's actually a really cool thing to be able to do, is to be able to figure out when these species split from each other, even if we don't have any fossil evidence for them in particular. So that got people really interested in using this data and kind of buying into the usefulness of a neutral rate of molecular evolution. But it didn't take long for people to notice things in figures like this. So for example, these pairs of species split about the same amount of time ago, right? So cows and horses split from each other about the same amount of time ago as rodents and rabbits. But in that time, these guys have obviously had more generations in the last 60 million years than these guys, right? These guys mate uh, maybe once a year, once every two years, something like that. These guys mate and get a multiple generations per year. And all of our mathematics was based on mutation rates per generation and substitutions per generation. So we would actually expect populations with shorter generation times to diverge faster, just because there's more generations per year. But that's not what we saw, right? We actually saw them diverging genetically at about the same rate per year instead of generation, which is actually not what Motu Kimura here predicted with his mathematics. So when you have a prediction and it's turning out to have a problem with it, you need to figure out why. So why don't we see faster rates of molecular evolution for these guys versus these guys? Well, as with many things in science, often a person's student outdoes them or kind of saves the day. So Tomoko Ota was a student of Motu Kimura, and what she did was she went back and looked at this whole scenario, and she thought about, well, what if most mutations are what are called nearly neutral? What if they're just slightly deleterious? So they would kind of look neutral to us. Right? You wouldn't be able to look at an individual with that mutation and say, oh, it's got a lower fitness. But it would have a slightly deleterious effect, like maybe reduce fitness by one one thousandth of a percent or something. So if this is the case, and it may well be, right, because even mutations in proteins that aren't near the active site, they'll do something to the protein. Since selection is more effective in larger populations, these new mutations, we would expect them to fit at a slower rate in larger populations. So larger populations will be able to select against these slightly deleterious alleles better than small populations. So remember, when is selection more effective than drift? It's when you have a really large population. Larger populations will be better at preventing the fixation of some of these alleles. This means that there will be a slowing of the per generation substitution rate of larger populations. But larger populations are the ones that have shorter generation times. So per generation, they're evolving more slowly, but they have more generations per year, and those things are gonna cancel each other out and give us a constant rate per year. So when we think about molecular evolution, we have this neutral theory proposed by Motu Kimura, most fixed mutations were neutral. The substitution rate is therefore mu for all species and shouldn't really vary much between different organisms. The nearly neutral theory, this modification of Kimura's theory by Tomoko Ota, most fixed mutations are nearly neutral, slightly deleterious, and the balancing of stronger selection against these mutations in larger populations, and the shorter generation times of those species, right, larger populations tend to be smaller organisms, that results in this constant rate per time that we observe. And then there's actually a third theory or hypothesis about how molecular evolution works. The chief proponent is a guy called Gillespie, and he would argue that almost nothing is actually truly neutral, and many of these fixations that look to be neutral are actually beneficial, since almost everything is under selection to some form. These like constant rate results here aren't true, and so in fact molecular clocks are untrustworthy. So there are three different ways of thinking about molecular evolution. How do we decide? Right? If you were to 
actually go through and go into evolutionary biology and try to pick a controversy and teach about a controversy within evolutionary biology, this would be the biggest thing that people argue about, is whether new substitutions tend to be neutral, nearly neutral, or quite often advantageous. So this is a more complex topic. There's lots of different stuff goes into here. So I teach two other evolutionary biology courses here at Cal State. One of them is advanced evolution, and it is in fact the very first thing that we talk about in this class is the debate between these different theories and hypotheses for how molecular evolution works. And I also teach a molecular evolution course where we look at these things again, more detailed molecular point of view.